my privilege to welcome each and all to the morning worship service here at the Bremen Church of Christ. For those visiting, we're certainly glad you've decided to be with us. Please take a moment, fill out an attendance card, pass it to the center aisle. We'll pick that up at the close of our service. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for morning worship, 6 o'clock Sunday evening, 7 o'clock on Wednesday for a midweek Bible study. To Johnny McDaniel, our song leader, select a number 238 if you wish to turn to that. 238 will be our first song this morning. Brother Stephen Higley will lead our minds in prayer at the appropriate time. Brother Sidney White will bring us the message of the hour. And Ken Glover will conclude our service in prayer this morning. Several on our prayer list I wish to bring to your attention. Dina Cook, Louise Smith's granddaughter, is to have surgery this Wednesday. Louise Smith herself is not feeling well. She went to the doctor last week. They diagnosed her as having a TIA, so we certainly need to remember her at this time. My cousin Scott and Ellen McBrayer's baby, Wyatt, uh, is not doing well. He is uh, hopeful of having some surgery, or his family's hopeful of having some surgery this coming week, but certainly they solicit our prayers. Glad to see Brother Ray Spake with us this morning. Frida Gray is also with us this morning as well. We're glad to report. Others I wish to bring to your attention, my dad, Jerry Stevenson, is to have a uh, surgical procedure this coming Tuesday, day after tomorrow, at Piedmont. Also, Phyllis Glover is scheduled to have a hernia outpatient surgery this week. Frank Head also has a procedure upcoming this Thursday. Brothers Keepers Group 3 will meet after the evening service tonight in the Fellowship Hall. Brothers Keepers Group 4 will meet next Saturday, August the 7th, at the home of the Hodges at 6 p.m. More information in this week's bulletin. Also this coming Saturday, August the 7th, will be the Parents' Night Out here at the building in the Fellowship Hall from 5 to 9 p.m. Brothers Keepers Groups 2 and 3 will combine forces to host this event. If you do not have children and you're part of this group, we could certainly use your help and looking after and entertaining the youngins as the parents' night out again this coming Saturday from 5 to 9 p.m. There's a gospel meeting that begins today at the Bowden Congregation. Brother Cliff Goodwin, no stranger to us here, will be conducting that meeting. The services are each evening at 7.30, including tonight, uh, August 1, today through the 5th. Brother Cliff Goodwin meeting at Bowden. There's an area-wide singing at the Rome Congregation August the 13th, if you wish to plan for that. The truck from Rain Tree Village Children's Home is scheduled to be here September the 13th. There is a listing of what they desire on the bulletin board if you wish to participate in that. There's a rafting trip, again, that's planned for Saturday week, August the 14th. If you wish to go, please see Brother Johnny. And those that are participating in the Good Samaritan Point program, please report your points today to Stephanie Hodges. Would you bow with me, please? Holy and righteous Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings of life that you shower upon us. May we use these to thy name's honor and glory as you give us talents. Father, as we worship thee today, may we dismiss everything of a worldly nature from our minds and focus on our purpose here to worship thee as you desire so that you will be pleased with our effort and we will be edified as a result. For those that we've mentioned this morning that desire part in our prayer, Father, we're mindful of their infirmity. We ask that you watch over those that tend to their needs. May these surgical procedures that are upcoming be successful, but thy will be done in all things, Father. Help us to have courage and wisdom to understand. Continue to watch over and forgive us when we fail thee. Be with those that have a public part in our worship this morning. May it be most needful for us at this time. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing now number 238. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life sin and open the light gate oh may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice oh come 
to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he had done O oh, perfect redemption the purchase of blood to every believer the promise of for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing number 713, 713. Yeah. 
Father, we thank thee for this opportunity to assemble around this table, partake of these emblems as we about partake of the bread which represents your son's body. May we partake in a manner well pleased in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In serving the bread, we overlook anyone. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this cup, which represents the blood that, blood that flowed out of our Savior on the cross. Our Heavenly Father, we pray now that each one of us will reflect back on that cross and think about the blood that came forth from our Savior pray that you bless this cup. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We miss anyone in our serving. This concludes the Lord's Supper. Now we have an opportunity to give us. We've been prospered. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee for another day of life that we have to enjoy with thee. 
We ask you, thank thee for all the blessings thou gives us each day of our lives. As we give back to thee, may we give cheerfully and without grudgingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Four hundred fifty six. Four five six. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given. Oh, This morning, number 232, 232. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Let's pray. Our dear, kind, and most gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful to Thee for this day and for all the blessings that holds to us. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful to Thee for allowing us to be able to meet inside of this building to worship Thee in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, please be with us to go out and proclaim Thy message to a lost and dying world in sin that they may come to know thy Son and to be able to have salvation. Heavenly Father, we are thankful to thee for everything that thou hast given us. And please bless us as we go through this service and throughout the rest of our lives that we may live a life that is worthy of thee. Heavenly Father, we are thankful most of all for your only Son who came to this earth to die for our sins. In Jesus' name. Number eight will be the invitation song at the conclusion of Sydney's lesson. Number eight, if you'd like to mark that. Before the lesson, we'll sing number 51. 51. Let us stand and sing all three verses of Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, before our lesson. And let's sing out together. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I'm weak, but thou art mighty, hold me with the powerful hand. Bread of heaven, feed me till I walk no more. Bread
Matthew chapter 16, beginning with about verse 13, Matthew records that Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi and asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Peter gave a response that some were saying that he was John the Baptist or Elijah, Jeremiah, perhaps one of the other prophets. Jesus then asked very specifically to the apostles, but whom say ye that I am? Peter's response was, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus pronounced a blessing upon him when he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Promise of our Lord to the apostles on that occasion that he would build his church. When we come to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, we read that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. In Acts chapter 5, we learn that after the occasion of Ananias and Sapphira, that great fear came upon the church. And there are numerous passages of that nature following Acts chapter 2 in which there is reference made to the church. In our study last week, we began to look at this concept in view of all of the religious division that exists in our world today. When we read, for example, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, the Lord added to the church. Luke, in recording that statement, did not have to specify which church was under consideration because there was only one at that point. It was the one that Jesus promised to build, that he did build, that we referenced in Matthew chapter 16. But through the centuries, men have left the teachings of the Word of God and have taught things that are contrary thereto. And as a result of that, there has been a departure from the way, and there have been other ways that have now been presented in that regard. So now the question of the day is, of which church are you a member? That question would not have been asked in the first century because there was the only option, the Lord's church. And so we began to look at this concept in view of numerous passages of Scripture in our study last week. And we noted that the Bible foretells that there is going to be a falling away that there is going to be a departure from the way of God. We noted, for example, in Acts chapter 20, and in verse 28 beginning, when Paul was speaking with the Ephesian elders, he encouraged them to take heed to yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in, not sparing the flock. Even of your own selves shall men arise, teaching perverse things, 
to draw away disciples after them. So Paul warns the elders of Ephesus of such a departure and even tells them that even of your own selves, even among the elders of the church at Ephesus, he said, some shall arise teaching perverse things, things that are contrary to the will of God, and drawing away disciples after them. That is, they would teach things contrary to the word of God. As a result of that teaching, they would have people following them rather than following the truth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read a rather lengthy passage, verses 3 through 12, that we'll not reread today, in which Paul writes concerning that falling away as he writes to the church at Thessalonica. Then in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes to Timothy in that same regard that there would come a falling away. And in 2 Peter chapter 4, or rather 2 Timothy chapter 4, he further tells what he's talking about. When he exhorts Timothy before God and the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears and shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So we've noted that the Lord said, I will build my church. But almost in the same breath said that there would come a departure from that way. There is the foretelling of that. We want to pick up at that point this morning and look at some other things in that regard, in the second Thessalonian letter again, in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes again concerning this kind of circumstance when he says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. He refers to them as perilous days for a specific reason. Notice what he says. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort, so he's already given a rather lengthy description of a certain group of people. Of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. As Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest in all men as theirs also was. So in this particular section, Paul gives us somewhat of a description of people without conscience, people without character, people without conviction who would contribute to the apostasy that is talked about in various sections of Scripture. Here are the kind of people who will be responsible from a departure from the faith. It is sad indeed to reflect back on the death of our Lord on Calvary's cross, realizing that he shed his blood and that blood served as the purchase price of the church. He said, I will build my church. Paul said to those of Asian elders, he talks about the church of God or the church of Lord of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. 
to think about that fact and then to realize that men would turn away from the truth, turn away from the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and begin to establish other organizations simply because they do not want the truth. They resist the truth, the Bible says, and as a result, contribute to the apostasy that is being spoken of here. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 and following, which we noted a moment ago, Paul further tells us, in view of the fact that there will be such men of such nature and character, that they will resist the truth, that they will begin to, to turn people away from the truth, Incidentally, people said there are many who will follow their pernicious ways. Paul tells Timothy what needs to be done. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. We don't change the truth. We don't change the word simply because there are people who do not like the truth of Almighty God. We do not have the right to change that truth to change it in any way, to add to it, take from it, alter it. As a matter of fact, Peter said there would be those who would rest, W-R-E-S-T, or twist the truth, and he said the consequence of that is to their own destruction. That is exactly why. There are so many different religious organizations, so many different churches, if you please, in our day and time. That is exactly what men like Paul wrote about and spoke about would take place somewhere down the line. As a matter of fact, as we noted from 2 Thessalonians in our study last week in chapter 2, Paul said it is already now working when he wrote that letter. Didn't take it long to start, did it? For people to turn away from God's word and start developing other messages that would lead people away from the truth and the formation of other religious organizations in that regard. In 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and this is a passage that we alluded to a moment ago, in verse 1, Peter gives somewhat of a profile of that individual. He said, But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false prophets among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You see, they're not content just to speak things contrary to the truth, but they'll even speak against the truth. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. And he goes ahead and points out, that God will not spare those people. To think about the very fact. And these are inspired writers who are warning us of what's going to take place. That there are people who come in with, with uh, feigned words, make merchandise of you. They'll make a merchandise out of their message. I challenge you to watch, don't really listen too much, but watch some of those religious programs that you have on television nowadays and try to keep a record of how many of them do not, do not ask for contributions or donations. That's what they're really after is your money. They're making merchandise of you to promote the false doctrine, the damnable heresies that they are preaching and teaching. They're not teaching the truth. Take your Bible and follow along with them and see how often they follow exactly what the Word of God says in its context. And yet there's so many people who swallow what they say, as we used to say, hook, line, and sinker. In the book of Jude, 
Jude writes concerning the very same kind of thing. When he talks about ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's in Jude, verse 4. Then in 1 John, chapter 4, and in verse uh, 1, John says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Do those passages not mean anything to us? Do they not mean anything to the people of the world that God in His holy word has warned that there shall be false teachers right and left? Now what we have, in addition to the Lord's church that Jesus promised to build, for which He shed His blood, hundreds of churches existing in our society. That ought to wake us up, folks. That ought to cause us, if we are interested in heaven, to take our Bibles and see what the Bible teaches about matters of religion. Well, but what are the forces behind such an apostasy? Well, when you go back to the very beginning, what was it that caused Adam and Eve to fall? And when you answer that question, you can know exactly why there has been such an apostasy away from the truth of God that has resulted in so many different religious organizations. The answer to that is simply a lack of respect for the Word of God. God had said to Adam and Eve, dress and keep the garden. And of every fruit, every tree of the garden, of the fruit thereof, thou mayest freely eat, with one exception. And he said, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The devil comes along and he sells Eve a bill of goods. He said, Not only will you not die, you'll become like God. Lack of respect for the Word of God resulted in Adam and Eve doing exactly what God had said don't do and brought about their spiritual death and ultimately physical death to mankind in so doing. Take your Old Testament for just a minute if you want to do that. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8, it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Then he gives the names of them, Joel and Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Then you turn over to verse uh, 20, that we also may be like all the nations. There's their reasoning. That's what prompted them to desire and to become dissatisfied with the arrangement of, of leadership that God has provided for them. Why couldn't they come to Samuel and say, Samuel, you're old, and your sons are not walking in your ways. We need the kind of leadership that you provided for us. We need to get back to God's way of government, not like your sons are leading us. But they didn't. They said, we want the kind of leadership that will enable us to be like everybody around us. Lack of respect 
for the word of God in that regard, dissatisfied with God's arrangement of government and wanted to be like other nations. In 1 Kings chapter 12, and I want you to look at this very closely. It may be a, something here that uh, tie a couple of things together for you that you may or may not have seen before. But in 1 Kings chapter 12, beginning in verse uh, 26, now this is the point in time of the nation of Israel dividing. They had come into the land of Canaan. They had, they had taken over the land of Canaan. They now possessed that land. They were living in that land. And they had done that for uh, several years now under the leadership of uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. But now Rehoboam comes into power and, and there's rebellion against Rehoboam. And there's a division in the kingdom as a result of it. Now it comes to be known, the ten northern tribes, basically speaking, as uh, Israel and the southern tribes as Judah. Jeroboam takes over the leadership and the revolt that ultimately forms the northern ten tribes of Israel. So that's where we are, that the division has taken place. Verse 26, 1 Kings chapter 12 Jeroboam said in his heart. Now did you get that? Jeroboam said in his heart. What's he doing? He's basically taking counsel with himself. He's not taking counsel with God. He's not taking counsel with the elders of the people of that day. He is taking counsel with no one but himself. He's doing what he wants to do. He said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel, now here's what I want you to notice, and made two calves of gold. Now usually when we talk about the, the dividing of the kingdom, we simply talk about it in kind of generic terms, Jeroboam setting up two altars, one in Dan and one in Bethel. Now we'll see that in a minute. But I think it's interesting here that the record doesn't just say that Jeroboam set up two altars in Dan and Bethel. What did it say? He made two calves. Now I want you to look further to what he said. And said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods. O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Did you get that? Is this the first time we've read about this kind of thing? No, no, no. You go back to Mount Sinai. When Moses went up to that mount, and the people began to be concerned because he had been there so long, and perhaps thought he wasn't coming back. And they convinced Aaron... To make a golden calf. Oh, what did they say? Made two calves. Caused Aaron to make a golden calf. And what did Aaron say about that calf? This is the God that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What did Jeroboam say? The very same thing that Aaron had said. So it wasn't just a couple of altars. We've actually regressed here in the nation of Israel. All the way back to Mount Sinai. And the building of that golden calf. That's where the people are at this point. That's where they are. Why would Jeroboam do such a thing? Because he did not respect the word of God. That's why he did it. God had instructed that Jerusalem be the place of worship, not Dan and Bethel. <clears throat> but because of his selfishness, 
because he wanted the people to serve him, because he was afraid for his own life, because of his own selfishness, he did this thing. Folks, that is exactly why there are so many different churches that exist in our land today. Because men have said we don't respect the word of God. They haven't said that specifically, but that's the, that's the implication of their action. We do not respect the word of God. We're going to do what we want to do. We're going to think within ourselves what we ought to do. You notice some of these councils and conventions that convene periodically of various religious organizations. And during the course of those conventions, they take a vote. They decide what the position of their particular organization is going to be on certain issues, whether it's the gay issue, marriage, divorce, remarriage, whatever it might be. Here's what the position of the church is going to be. They are, con they are counseling among themselves. They're not taking counsel with the Word of God. And that's why there's so many different churches from which men have to choose today. Because folks have had lack of respect for the Word of God. There is no way that you can read and study and follow the Word of God and come up with modern day denominationalism to save your life. There's no way. The only way you can come up with it is to go back to the formation of this kind of thing that was forewarned in the scriptures that we've already noted and see how it began. Luke chapter 12. You remember the story of that rich farmer who had the bumper crop as we might say and the Bible says that he, he thought within himself what he was going to do. And you remember the Lord's response to what he thought, thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee, then, then who shall those things be? I wonder how often today God looks at the religious division of our day and says to different people, thou fool. It is so foolish to have a lack of respect for the Word of God and as a result go off in directions independent of the Word of God in the formation of all kinds of religious practices, names, organizations. It is unbelievable. But as we noted in 2 Thessalonians 2 when Paul wrote that letter, it was already beginning to develop. You remember in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Under what? Another gospel. It was happening in the churches of Galatia. It was happening in the regions of Thessalonica already departing from the faith as a result of those who were teaching false doctrine. Oh, there's so many passages we can note in that regard. Our time is almost gone. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to notice a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 10. Keep in mind when Paul addresses the, churches, uh, the church at Corinth, first four chapters of the first letter is basically dealing with division that existed in that church. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, or by His authority, that you all speak the same thing, there be no divisions among you, you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. If there's anything contrary to this passage of Scripture, it's modern-day denominationalism. They don't speak the same thing. Depends on which, you know, you have to, what does this group teach about this? What does that group teach about? And you can get all kinds of different answers. 
on the same subject. What did Paul say? Speak the same thing. No divisions among you. Be perfectly joined together. Same mind, same judgment. But now look at verse 21. In that same context of division, Paul writes, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Foolishness of preaching. In chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech, or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And Paul preached that same message wherever he went, according to the fourth chapter of this letter. Not a different message in different places, resulting in the formation of different churches. But the gospel of Jesus Christ will lead men to Christ and to none other. Basically, it's a matter of, of going beyond that which God has written. John worded it like this, Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. When we abide in the doctrine of Christ, we'll be exactly that for which our Lord died children of God, members of the Lord's church, the one that you read about in this New Testament. That ought to be our desire today, going beyond. But our time is gone. We'll need to stop there. But I hope these things will cause us to, at least if we're honest and sincere and wanting to get to heaven, will cause us to stop and think about all of the religious confusion that you and I face right in our own area. Who's right? Can everybody be right going in all different directions? Oh, I know what the religious world says to us. We're all headed to the same place. We're just going different ways. No, there's not but one way to heaven, folks. There are not different ways to get to heaven. You won't read that in your Bible either. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. It's by His way, His will, what He says. That's what we're going to be judged by. John chapter 12 and verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not, my word hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So let me encourage you to study your Bibles carefully. To be sure that you're following what the Word of God teaches, not what some organization somewhere teaches independent of the Word of God and contrary to the same. This morning, if you're not a child of God, you need to be baptized into Christ. We'd certainly encourage you to do that based upon your faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and a willingness to turn away from sin and confess that faith. If you need to come back home, you've erred from the faith like those brethren in Galatia. You need to come back home asking God's forgiveness. And if we can assist you in that, we'd be delighted to. As we stand together, sing the song today. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?
close this morning with number 220, 220. Again, we're thankful for your presence here at our worship service. We invite you back for our evening worship at 6 p.m. Sing verses 1 and 3. Take the name of Jesus with you, and then we'll be led in our closing prayer. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. Bow together, please. <clears throat> Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we bow before thee this morning with thankful hearts because of this privilege we've had to be together to study your divine word. We pray, Father, that you'll be with your teachers and your preachers and bless them in their efforts to spread and to teach your word. Pray that you bless those that are working in the mission fields. Give them the strength and the support that they need to carry on as they teach your word. Father, be with those that are sick or afflicted, that need your help in order to get well. Pray that you bless them, Father. Forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings that we have in our lives. Help us, Father, to recognize the weaknesses in our lives and be quick to repent of them and to seek your forgiveness. Most of all, Father, we're grateful for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we offer this prayer. Amen. <clears throat>